The following KQED production was produced in high definition. In ancient China, they were believed to be a giant celestial dragon devouring the sun. The court astronomers were charged with predicting total solar eclipses. And the legend is that when a couple of astronomers did not correctly predict a total solar eclipse, off with their heads. In time, as scientists discovered how the sun, the moon, and the earth are interconnected, fear of eclipses was replaced with awe. Even if you're a scientist, it just isn't right. The hair on your back goes up. It's like, this isn't right to have the sun vanish. There are people so drawn to solar eclipses that they'll travel halfway around the world to witness one. I am an eclipse chaser, for absolute sure. As a physicist with San Francisco's Exploratorium, Paul Doherty actually gets paid to pursue eclipses. Eclipse chasers go after eclipses wherever they happen on the Earth. I went to an eclipse in the Atacama Desert of Chile. And before that, I got to go to Zambia, Africa. And then two eclipses in Turkey on the edge of the Mediterranean. The timing of a solar eclipse has to do with how often the moon comes between the sun and the Earth. The orbit of the moon is actually tilted a little bit so that the moon most of the time passes above the sun or below the sun. Every one or two years, though, the moon passes right in between the Earth and the sun, and the conditions are right for a total solar eclipse. So when this happens, why are only some people able to see it? Well, it all has to do with size. The sun is much bigger than the moon, and so the sunlight from the edges of the sun actually shines around the edges of the moon and makes a shadow that is a cone. It comes to a tiny point. And during a total solar eclipse, this cone of darkness, it's called the umbra, makes a spot on the Earth that's only about 100 miles wide. As the Earth and the moon rotate and orbit, this shadow travels several thousands of miles in a curved path. If you take an Earth globe and a wet piece of spaghetti and throw the wet piece of spaghetti at the Earth globe, you get a pretty good representation of the path of an eclipse. Only the people fortunate enough to be along that path will be able to see the eclipse. And this brings us back to the chase. It turns out that the Bay Area has been a hotbed of eclipse chasing for a long time. One of the most famous chasers was Charles Burkhalter, the first director of Oakland's Chabot Space and Science Center, which opened in 1883 as the Chabot Observatory. The superintendent of the Oakland schools had seen a an observatory at a public school system in Philadelphia. And he was really captivated by this idea and decided that this was something that Oakland should have as well. Eventually, it dawned on somebody that they actually needed some people who knew about telescopes to run the observatory and to keep all the equipment properly adjusted. And that's how Burkhalter originally became involved. Burkhalter, a math and astronomy teacher, had actually set up an observatory in his own backyard. When he became the director of Chabot in 1885, his position gave him the means to become an eclipse chaser. At the time, photos of the sun's atmosphere, or corona, were the only tools scientists had to study the sun. Determined to photograph the corona, Burkhalter set sail for the 1898 India eclipse. It was a very lengthy journey by sea to get there with all of his equipment. And the region was actually in the midst of a, an outbreak of plague at the time. But Burkhalter, as his letters home revealed, was undeterred. My average day's work during the 37 days in camp was not less than 16 hours a day, and part of this under a fierce Indian sun that must be felt to be appreciated. Burkhalter's persistence was rewarded with the photos he was able to take at the moment of totality, when the moon covers all of the sun, except for the corona. 
But when Burkhalter printed his India photos, he saw that they didn't show all of the atmosphere's detail. Either the really brightest parts of the picture would be overexposed if you wanted to see the fainter parts of the sun's atmosphere, or the other way around. You could see the bright parts, but then you wouldn't have any of the, the faint parts. Uh, so the problem was, how do you get a complete picture of the sun's atmosphere in one photographic plate? To solve the problem, Burkhalter invented a mask that varied the exposure time by rotating in front of the camera. This uh, kind of spiral-shaped piece here, he would use that to determine the shape of his mask that he was making. Charles Burkhalter's invention was uh, like a fan blade used to control the amount of light passing through and, and hitting the photographic plate. Burkhalter tried out his mask during his expedition to the southern United States to photograph the Georgia eclipse of 1900. And here's an example of a picture Burkhalter took with his innovation, his uh, rotating mask. You can see details in the very brightest parts of the sun's atmosphere, close to the sun's surface, and then even far out into space. In his perfectly exposed images, masses of hot solar gas, called prominences, explode on the sun's surface, while the outer corona floats around like a flower. The results were breathtaking. He got uh, acclaim from astronomers around the world. Photos like Burkhalter's would later be used to prove part of Einstein's theory of relativity. Today's eclipse chasers travel more for fun than for science, but they're just as willing as Burkhalter was to make an arduous trip. My most recent total solar eclipse was August 1st, 2008, and it was on the edge of the Gobi Desert in China. And I thought about that as the most remote place on Earth. And after flying for 24 hours and taking a bus for 16 hours, I stepped out of the bus on this barren, rock-covered Gobi Desert three days before the sun was going to be eclipsed there. Doherty and his team of NASA and Exploratorium personnel set up shop and prepared to broadcast the eclipse live to 100 science museums across the United States and to one million people through the web. Thousands of people have come to witness a truly spectacular natural event. And for the next hour, the Exploratorium and NASA are going to bring you the sights and sounds of this total eclipse from here near Yiwu in China. In San Francisco, a crowd camped out at the Exploratorium and waited for the eclipse to begin at 3.30 a.m. I think it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be super cool, awesome, stuff like that. But in China, not everything was going according to plan. About 10 minutes before totality, clouds moved in and blocked the sun, and we were heartbroken. We could heard a lot of booing in the audience out here because <laughs> they're really wishing these clouds to go away. One minute before totality, the clouds cleared, and it let us see as the moon moved to block the sun in its entirety. As the sun completely disappeared behind the moon, the last rays of sun peeked through the moon's valleys in what are called Bailey's beads. We have a diamond ring, a really nice diamond ring. Then a bright light called the diamond ring announced the start of totality. There were two wonderful prominences on opposite sides of the sun reaching out from behind the disk of the moon during totality. It's a great spectacle. You should definitely go see a total solar eclipse whenever you can. Humans have a vested interest in keeping an eye on the sun. Prominences warn us of solar magnetic storms that can hurt astronauts in space and cause power outages on Earth. These storms originate in the part of the corona closest to the sun's surface, and this inner corona can only be photographed during an eclipse. But perhaps solar eclipses' biggest contribution to science is still the curiosity they inspire. Hey, Keep Quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org slash quest.